those people out of there. So I will support the Boehner resolution, but I prefer the Kucinich resolution because it sends a very strong signal and tells the president in no uncertain terms that Fire. he cannot take us to war without the consent of the people of this country. Gentleman from California. Uh, thank you, Ms. Madam Speaker, and um, I initially just yield myself such time as I may consume. Gentleman's recognized. I think it's important to get the record straight on what we're doing and what we're not doing. No boots in the ground did not come because of this resolution we're considering now. This was the decision of the President, the Commander of Chief, at the time. But the figures given by my, my friend from Indiana don't reflect the reality of our participation. What are we doing now? While we're not in the lead, the United States is contributing significantly to the operation. Fighter aircraft for the suppression of enemy air defense, ISR aircraft, electronic war aircraft, warfare aircraft, aerial refueling aircraft, one guided missile destroyer, and predator armed unmanned aerial surveillance systems. 24%, not two thirds of the total aircraft, 27% of the total sorties flow in, over 75% of all refueling sorties, 70% of intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Now, there's no boots on the ground, but to me, that involvement implicates the War Powers Resolution. This is within the meaning of that bill. And once again, only Kucinich has before us a proposal that seeks to deal with the requirements of the War Powers Resolution. I just think we should get the record straight about what our involvement is. It's not as large as the previous speaker said, but it is significant and it, it's within, my opinion, it's within the, uh, the terms of the War Powers Resolution. I'm now pleased to yield two minutes to my friend from California, the gentlelady from California, Ms. Lee. Gentlelady from California is recognized for two minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Let me thank our ranking member uh, for yielding. And let me just say, first of all, I, I rise in opposition uh, to the Boehner resolution, but this debate is long overdue. On March 30th, uh, myself, along with Congresswoman Woolsey, Honda, Grijalva, and Waters, sent a letter to Speaker Boehner and Majority Leader Cantor requesting that they hold a debate and floor vote on the President's authority to continue the use of military force in Libya. Let me ask for unanimous consent, please, to insert the letter into the record. Without objection. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'd like to read parts of this letter, if I may. Dear Speaker Boehner and Majority Leader Cantor, we, this was dated March 30th, mind you, we, the undersigned members, right to request the United States House of Representatives immediately take steps to hold a debate and floor vote on the President's authority to continue the use of military force in Libya. We cite the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8. We go on to say that the United States has now been engaged militarily in Libya since March 19, 2001. While we firmly believe that a robust debate and an up or down vote should have occurred in advance of United States military action in Libya, it is without question that such measures are still urgently required. Beyond defending congressional authority in these matters, these deliberations are essential to ensuring that we as a country fully debate and understand the strategic goals, costs, and long-term consequences of military action in Libya. That's one paragraph of this sentence. Now, Madam Speaker, over 60 days since our letter, the Speaker has suddenly, hastily scheduled a resolution in that frankly does nothing but serve to politicize what is an extremely serious and what should be a nonpartisan issue. As we know, the War Powers Act specifically forbids armed forces from engaging in military action. May I have an additional minute, please? I yield the gentlelady an additional minute. The lady is recognized much. for additional minute. The War Powers Act specifically forbids armed forces from engaging in military action in foreign lands for more than 60 days without congressional authorization or the use of military force or a declaration of war. We've been actively fighting now for 77 days. This is not just about our mission in Libya. 
And let me just say, I think our president, who frankly has done a commendable job in handling a very complex range of foreign policy issues, but it's about any president, any administration. It's not about that. It's about standing up for congressional power granted in the Constitution. And as our ranking member said, the Kucinich Amendment is the amendment that addresses this head-on in a very honest and direct way. So we should reject this politically motivated resolution. It's a resolution that has just come up. We asked again the Speaker and Majority Leader on March 30th to conduct debate, a debate and an up or down vote. And we conclude in our letter that it's our position that the President has a constitutional obligation to seek Fired. specific statutory authority for offensive military actions as he should have done with regard to U.S. military engagement in Libya. Thank you again and thank you for yielding. Gentlelady from Florida. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm pleased to yield three minutes to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, a valued member of our Foreign Affairs Committee. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, and I thank my colleague from Florida, and I rise respectfully in support of House Resolution 292, which reasserts the Congressional War Making Authority of Section 8, Article 1 of the Constitution. And I respectfully disagree with our, my ranking member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, for whom I have enormous respect. I don't think this resolution takes gratuitous pot shots at the President of the United States. I think it is a thoughtful exposition of the issues in front of us and the requirements that we want to put on the President. And it buys the President time to comply without the disruption that the Kucinich resolution would cause, not only, not only in Libya, but the ramifications for NATO relationships and in the Arab Democratic Spring. The resolution prohibits the President from deploying ground troops in Libya and declares Congress has the constitutional prerogative to withhold funding for any unauthorized use of U.S. armed forces. It requires the administration to transmit to the House of Representatives any records regarding congressional communication and Operation Odyssey Dawn in Libya within 14 days of passage. Mr. Speak Madam Speaker, since before the passage of the War Powers Resolution in 1973, the executive branch, regardless of party or leader, has argued that there are inherent constitutional powers contained in the constitutional reference to the President as Commander-in-Chief. If one argues that Section 2, Article 2 of the Constitution grants the President inherent powers as Commander-in-Chief, then logically one ought to acknowledge Congress also has inherent powers as the only entity expressly granted the power to declare war in that document. According to the House report regarding war powers resolution, consultation means that a decision is pending on a problem and that members of Congress are being asked by the President for their advice and opinions and in appropriate circumstances their approval of the action contemplated. This report language makes the intention of the war powers resolution clear. Consultation ought to be active, not merely informative. In the War Powers Resolution, the term hostilities was used deliberately instead of armed conflict precisely because the former phrase is broader nature. The Constitution and War Powers Resolution are clear. Congress must have a role with regard to the use and deployment of U.S. forces. The extent of that role has been the subject of debate as old as the United States itself. To go even further, a strict constructionist would argue that the War Powers Resolution itself limits congressional authority. The act of even acknowledging the need for a statutory framework to codify Congress's powers in the Constitution, in fact, dilutes those powers and may have the unintended effect of enhancing the executive's powers directly at the expense of Congress. I urge my colleagues to vote in favor of this resolution, House Resolution 292, to assert congressional authority and to buy the President time with which to comply. And I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from California. Yes, Madam Speaker, I yield my si such time as I may consume. Gentleman's recognized. I'd like to respond to my friend's arguments. I agree with every word he said except the Congress. This is a manifestation of the Congress exercising its authority. This is an abdication of Congress exercising its authority because nowhere in this resolution is the authorization for the operations that we want to. Uh, to authorize, uh, th that we should be authorizing if we think they're appropriate. The gentleman from Ohio doesn't think they're appropriate. Some of us do think it's appropriate, and this isn't about buying time. 
this is, we're not a supplicant to go to the executive branch and ask for uh, them to request of us authorization. We have the institutional power to decide what to do and our, this resolution fails to take that option. So I, I think the gentleman makes a wonderful case for why this resolution is not sufficient to step up to our responsibilities under the Constitution and the War Powers Resolution. And with that, I would like to yield uh, four minutes to the gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman. The gentleman from California is recognized for four minutes. Thank the gentleman for yielding. Been here a long time, and I've never come to this floor for the purpose of imposing in innocuous resolutions. In fact, I voted for every piece of innocuous legislation and post office renaming in the last 15 years, as far as I can remember. And this is innocuous legislation. First, it starts with a sense of Congress about uh, our opinion as to what should or shouldn't be done. It has a sentence that purports to prevent the president from putting ground forces in Libya, but in fact just states that that's our policy. It's certainly not designed to prohibit the president from doing so. It just says it's our opinion that he shouldn't. And oh, by the way, in the defense authorization bill, we have real legislation that prohibits putting ground forces in Libya. The, uh, it then goes on to ask that a number of questions be answered. And there are some who think, oh, that's important. Those who think that the questions propounded in this resolution are actually going to get us useful information are insulting the faculty of the law schools of America because both the Pentagon and the State Department have lawyers capable of writing long and meaningless answers to every question we propound. And as for getting documents, some of the documents demanded we already have, and the rest, those same lawyers, will be writing long documents about executive privilege. So we have here a document that at most is just the questions for the record that the, the chairwoman of our committee allows me to add at the end of so many hearings. Um, hardly earth-shaking, certainly innocuous. But, okay, so it's innocuous. Or is it? This is innocuous legislation that plays a particular role in avoiding the constitutional role of this Congress. It allows us to sidestep the War Powers Act. It gives cover to those who don't want to authorize or refuse to authorize. It says we're an advisory body. We ask some questions so that we can give good advice. We give you, we will we'll give the president some advice. It is part of the trend of an aggrandizing executive and a derelict Congress. A Congress that almost is complicit in this slow process by which we do not become legis we are not legislators, we are not deciders. We inquire and we advise. The Constitution is clear, but the War Powers Act is more clear. The president after, must ask for congressional authorization. Then we actually have to act, and that's tough. We have to review the proposals, and I believe our ranking member would have one, that uh, would say, okay, what are we going to authorize? Under what conditions? What demands will we make of our uh, allies in Libya uh, to perhaps uh, turn over to us or at least disassociate themselves from the al-Qaeda operatives in their midst? Uh, are we going to limit the duration? Are we going to limit the scope? Are we going to oppose limits on the total cost? With this resolution, we can avoid all those questions. We can avoid demanding a withdrawal. We can avoid limiting the authorization. And it, we can allow the president to continue to write the blank check that apparently he believes he has. And we can do it all while disassociating ourselves with anything unpopular that ever happens over the skies of Libya. Now is not the time for us to shirk our responsibilities. Our responsibility is to act as a policy-making body. I ask the gentleman for one more minute. Madam Speaker, how much time is remaining on each side? 
The gentleman from California has four and a half minutes remaining. I yield the gentleman an additional minute. The gentleman well, is you. recognized for an additional minute. Now is the time for us to play the role that the War Powers Act provides, because this is not an immediate short-term emergency situation. It has gone on for much longer than 60 days. It should not go further. Now, 208 members of this Congress voted for my amendment yesterday to say the, that we should not expend funds in violation of the War Powers Act. And you're willing to vote for it, even though I put it on a bill to which it really didn't pertain. Thank you for those votes. But now, please come back here and say it's time to enforce the War Powers Act. It's time not to dodge the War Powers Act. It's time for our policy over the skies in Libya to be determined by the President and Congress, not the President advised by Congress. Vote no on this resolution. Don't use it as a sidestep. Go back to your constituents and say you are for voting either for a withdrawal from Libya or for full authorization or for a limited authorization. I yield back. Gentlewoman from Florida. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm pleased to yield four minutes to my friend and colleague from Florida, Mr. Young, the chairman of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Defense. The gentleman from Florida is recognized for four minutes. And Madam Speaker, I, I thank my friend and the chairman for yielding me this time, because I think it is important to stress the importance of the Boehner Resolution. Uh, it deals specifically, especially on page four and page seven of the resolution, specifically with the Constitution and the constitutional responsibility of the administration and the Congress to work together, especially in matters of national security. As chairman of the Defense Appropriations Committee, as my colleague has said, my responsibility is to provide for the funding for any military operation that is approved by the Commander-in-Chief and approved by the Congress. On the matter of Libya, on April the 1st, I sent to the President a letter trying to exercise my responsibilities as chairman, a conciliatory letter actually, expressing support for our troops, but asking certain questions. How long do you think this will last? How much do you think it will cost? How much of a future commitment have we made? What will be the source of the funding for this operation. And here, more than two months later, still this official request from the Appropriations Committee remains unanswered by the administration. And that's just not right. The Constitution is pretty clear. Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution, in part, says, no money shall be drawn from the Treasury but in consequence of appropriations made by law and a regular statement and account of the receipts and expenditures of all public money shall be published from time to time. Well, so far on, this, on the Libya issue, this Article 1, Section 9 has been totally ignored. That's just not right. That's a violation, in my opinion, contravenes the, the Constitution itself. And when I asked for that information, uh, the only thing that I've been able to get on the cost of this Libyan operation is in bits and pieces we have added, and we come to about $750 million already spent uh, on the Libyan mission. They've not confirmed that, but we have put together in our own uh, edition bits and pieces on that. But, Again, we, we have received no, no request whatsoever. What I'm wondering is, where is the money to pay for the Libyan operation coming from? What account is it coming from? Is it coming out of personnel costs, uh, soldiers pay? Is it coming out of medical care? Is it coming out of training for our troops? What accounts are being used? We have a right and an obligation under the Constitution, know the answer to that. And Speaker Boehner's resolution calls very, very sharp attention uh, to that issue. So I think it's important that we pass, the, that the House passes the, the Boehner resolution 
and let the president know that we are not going to allow him to ignore the Constitution any further when it comes to war powers, when it comes to spending for the welfare of our troops, when it comes to appropriating money for the defense of our nation and for the defense of our allies. So, Madam Speaker, I do ask that the letter that I sent that the letter that I sent to the President, which has remained unanswered for more than two months, uh, that it be included uh, at this point in the record Without so objection. that the colleagues can see that it uh, was a very, very legitimate and very conciliatory request and basically an offer to support our troops in any legitimate activity. So we're still waiting. We're standing by, hoping that we do hear from the President uh, very soon and maybe shortly after we pass the Boehner Resolution. And I thank the Chair Lady for the time and I uh, yield back the time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from California. Uh, yes, Mr. Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to yield one minute to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Gentleman from Ohio is recognized for one minute. Uh, I, I thank uh, Mr. Berman. Uh, I ask unanimous consent uh, in, in defense of uh, Mr. Burton's description of U.S. involvement already in Libya to put into the record an article from The Guardian UK dated May the 22nd, which talks about the uh, United States um, having 50% uh, of the ships, 50% of the planes, 66% of the personnel, 93% of the cruise missiles. Without objection. And, and, I, and I just want to say um, briefly, Mr. Uh, uh, or Madam Speaker, that this article that was written a f uh, about 10 days ago, if it's true, it, it points out that we've undertaken a huge uh, uh, mission through the United States in the name of NATO now without coming to the Congress. That's what we're debating, of course. But if, on the other hand, the information that the administration has communicated as of late to the Congress. Uh, if that suggests a lighter footprint, then there should be no difficulty uh, in pulling out of Libya in 15 days. Uh, and if there is, we need to start asking questions about uh, how deeply enmeshed we are if our participation is, uh, is, is truly no boots on the ground. I thank the gentleman. Gentlelady, gentlelady from, Cal, uh, from Florida. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to yield two minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Stevers, a uh, member of the Financial Services Committee and a lieutenant colonel in the United States Army with a distinguished 26-year military career. Stivers, sorry. That's all right, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman you, from Madam Ohio Speaker. is recognized for two minutes. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Chairwoman for yielding me time. Uh, I rise in support of the Speaker's resolution. With 26 years of military service, my experience has taught me uh, many lessons, and those lessons give me pause and concern with regard to the Kucinich resolution. I think we need to be prudent, thoughtful, and measured in the way we end our involvement in Libya, and I don't believe that the Kucinich resolution does that. Even though the President did not follow proper procedures, and he should have allowed Congress to debate and decide the issue, um, a 15-day withdrawal would cause other issues. Certainly, the U.S. is providing, uh, currently the U.S. is providing important refueling, logistics, and other support functions for our NATO allies. And unfortunately, if you create a 15-day timeline, uh, those allies might ha not have time to plan or build capacity to resource their plan and effectively continue their operations. I don't agree with how the President's handled our current military mission in Libya, and I don't think he's currently explained the national security interest of our mission. However, I think the troops that have been called to action have performed admirably, and I thank them for their service. But now we're involved, and a time frame for withdrawal in the Kucinich resolution would hurt our NATO allies the same allies who have stood by us in Afghanistan for 10 years. They deserve our cooperation in any transition. I support the Speaker's alternative in Libya. I think it asks tough questions of the President, requires him to explain our national security interest and justify his strategy to Congress, 
and to the American people. If the President doesn't answer those questions within 14 days, I believe Congress should continue to assert its constitutional authority. Therefore, I support the, speaker, the Speaker's alternative resolution as a way forward in Libya. And in response to the gentleman from California, I'd like to say that I think Gentleman's it's important we get information fired. to make timely decisions. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I yield back the balance. Gentleman from California. Yes, Madam Speaker, to yield myself 15 seconds in response to uh, the previous speaker. What I'm curious about is what the resolution doesn't tell us. If the president doesn't provide us the information within 14 days, what are we doing? The resolution is silent. This is a resolution filled with things we want and are asking for and demand demanding and harumphing about with no consequences. I yield uh, a minute to the gentlelady from California, Ms. Woolsey. The gentlelady from California is recognized for one Former minute. Former member of the committee. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, Madam Speaker, this is a here we go again moment on the House floor. Two weeks ago, the Kucinich Amendment passed the House overwhelmingly with a total bipartisan vote because it was the right thing to do. But no, the other side of the aisle can't uh, stand to let us have an initiative, the right thing to do, that they really could agree to. So here we are today debating the Boehner resolution to take the air out of the question of whether the United States Congress or the White House has responsibility for the War Powers Act and begging them to know that it is our responsibility. Members should not be fooled into voting for the Boehner amendment, the resolution, uh, because it delays action. We should vote for the Kucinich resolution that insists that the Congress reclaim its authority, take its responsibility, and do the right thing regarding Libya. Vote no on the Boehner resolution. Gentlelady from Florida. Gentlelady continues to reserve. I reserve the right to close. Gentleman from California. Madam Speaker, I, I have no other requests for time and uh, am prepared to yield back uh, if the gentlelady is. I will use up our remaining uh, I, minute or so. I will yield back the balance of the my gentleman time. from California yields back the balance of his time. Gentlelady from uh, Florida is recognized. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. I uh, will then uh, take up the rest of our of our time. Madam Speaker, the resolution offered by the Speaker is uh, the responsible approach. It expresses congressional intent. It affords one last opportunity to the President and his administration to work with us in Congress to advance U.S. interest uh, in the region. And I hope that the President is listening and that uh, this resolution will serve as a wake-up call leading to immediate consultation. And frankly, we have not had that as we would like. If in 14 days, uh, as it says in this resolution, the President has not complied with the request included in the resolution, then this House will consider the next steps. And I urge, therefore, a yes vote on the Boehner resolution, a responsible approach to the President to work with us and a plea to give us the information that we've requested. With that, Madam Speaker, I yield back the balance of our time. It's back the balance of her time.
California is recognized for 10 minutes. Um, Madam Speaker, I yield myself such time as I might consume. Gentlemen, is recognized. Madam Speaker, I rise in support of this resolution. I do not believe that the President has provided adequate justification for our military operations in Libya, nor why continued intervention in a humanitarian stalemate is in our national interest. More than two weeks ago, I sent a letter to the President outlining my concerns regarding our strategy, our role within NATO operations, and the escalating costs of these operations at a time when the administration is asking the Department of Defense to make an additional $400 billion in cuts. To date, I have not received a, a reply. Yet I believe that forcing the hasty withdrawal of U.S. forces from NATO operations in Libya would embolden Qaddafi and gravely damage our credibility with our allies. Consequently, such a move could have dramatic, negative, second-order effects on operations that are critical to our national security, such as operations in Afghanistan. I believe Speaker Boehner's resolution addresses much of the frustration shared by members of this body. The resolution reinforces provisions in the recently passed National Defense Authorization Act, prohibiting the escalation of U.S. participation without express authorization from Congress. This resolution requires the President to clearly outline the strategic interests that justify intervention in Libya, to explain how the operational means being employed will secure them. It requires a prompt and transparent accounting of costs, as well as information regarding the capacity and intentions of the rebel forces. This information is essential to allow Congress to execute its constitutionally mandated oversight role of military operations. Again, I fully agree that the administration has been disturbingly dismissive of Congress' role in the authorization of military force. But I also feel that passing this resolution is the most effective way of holding the President accountable without sacrificing other vital national interests that would be damaged by a precipitous withdrawal from NATO operations. Madam Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from California reserves. The gentleman from Washington is recognized for 10 minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you. I do thank both Speaker Banner and Representative Kucinich for bringing these resolutions and bringing this issue to the floor, because I completely agree that this is an issue that Congress should debate, discuss, and should ultimately express its opinion on. Uh, we have not done that. We are now past 90 days uh, that this mission has been going on in Libya, and I feel we should have brought this up much sooner. Now, I prefer a much cleaner resolution that simply came out and made a resolution of approval of the President's mission and of the mission that we and NATO have undertaken in Libya and gave members the chance to vote it up or down. In that sense, Mr. Kucinich's resolution is much more straightforward. It's a resolution of disapproval, uh, but again, it gives us the opportunity to at least debate the issue and express the will of Congress. I do, however, oppose Mr. Boehner's resolution. I also oppose Mr. Kucinich's resolution because uh, I don't think we should pull away from this mission, should pull out of what NATO is doing uh, and the very important work that is going on in Libya. But Mr. Boehner's resolution doesn't do any of that, but it does rather baldly state that the President has not made a case for the mission in Libya. And I very strongly disagree with that assessment. Now, I will agree, and Mr. McKeon and I share the frustration, that prior to the launching of this mission, there was an inadequate amount of communication between the President and this Congress, indeed between the President and the American people, explaining the reasons for getting into that mission. But since that time, the President has made it very clear why we went into Libya. We had a unique situation. I do not believe the American military should intervene in every conflict in every country. In fact, I don't believe it should intervene in, in almost any of them. It takes a unique set of circumstances to call for that intervention. And in Libya, we had, I believe, that unique set of circumstances. Number one, we had broad international support. The UN, NATO, the Arab League all looked at that situation and said intervention was necessary. Number two, we had a clear humanitarian crisis. There was no doubt at the time that we intervened that if we had not, Muammar Gaddafi would have slaughtered his own people and reasserted control over Libya. He made it clear that what he was what he was going to do. It was clear that the people rising up for the legitimate opportunity to be heard in their government did not have the power and the force to stop him. We did. If we had not acted, 
There's no question that Muammar Gaddafi would be back in charge of Libya, and we would bear at least some piece of the responsibility. At least that is the way the rest of the world would have looked at it. We in the United States had the power, the force, to stop a humanitarian catastrophe and chose not to act. And that's one of the most critical elements in deciding whether or not we should intervene. Can we intervene in a successful way? Yes, there are many countries throughout the world that face crises right now. Uh, in Syria, in the Sudan, in Congo, a whole bunch of places. But in most of those places, in fact in all of those, there's no clear military mission that we could accomplish and achieve. In Libya there was. If we intervened, we could stop Gaddafi from regaining control of his entire country. Now, at the time, we understood there was no guarantee that that would mean that he would be driven from power immediately, but we could at least stop him from doing that. It was a humanitarian crisis that our actions could prevent. I think it made sense, and I think the President has clearly articulated that. So for the Congress to pass a resolution saying they have no earthly idea what the President is doing in Libya simply means that they haven't been paying attention for the last couple of months. It's been made clear. Now, I think it is appropriate that we ask the President to regularly keep in touch with us, let us know where the mission is going. I supported the resolution that said no ground troops in Libya. I think that is a step too far. I don't think that's something that would clearly be able to be accomplished militarily. So I do think that's appropriate. But the part of this resolution that I must oppose is the part that says the President has made no national security case for why we should be involved in Libya. I believe that he has, uh, and I don't think we should support a resolution saying otherwise. To have simply allowed a Libya, Libya to fall apart and not helped a people that we could clearly help that were legitimately calling for greater freedom and greater opportunity, I think would have been a mistake. So I will oppose the Boehner resolution. I will also oppose the Kucinich resolution because I don't believe we should pull out of the mission. But again, I thank all those involved for bringing this debate to the House floor so that we can have that debate so that we in Congress can assert our authority and express our opinion on this very, very important issue. And with that, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from California. Madam Speaker, I yield one and a half minutes to my friend and colleague, the Chairman of the Subcommittee on Tactical Air and Land Forces. The gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Bartlett. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized for a minute and a half. Uh, thank you for yielding, and I rise in support of the uh, Boehner uh, resolution. I'm not here today to argue whether or not we should be in Libya. That is an argument for another day. What I'm here today concerned with is how we got into Libya, because I think that uh, was a very important precedent. We went into Libya on March the 19th. Uh, Operation Odyssey Dawn. Just 12 days later, uh, the House Committee met and Secretary Gates was there and I made this statement. I am among many people who feel that President Obama has involved the United States in an unconstitutional and illegal war in Libya. That same day, I dropped uh, H.R. 1323, which asked the President to find offsets and non uh, defense discretionary spending to pay for the war in Libya that was not authorized by the Congress because we have no money and I shouldn't ask my kids and my grandkids to pay for that war. This is not the King's army. The power to move our army into Libya is not inherent in Commander-in-Chief. If it were, they would not have put in Article 1, Section 8 the responsibility of the Congress to declare war. This is an unconstitutional and illegal war. I think it sets a very dangerous precedent, and I hope that we make that very clear in our deliberations today. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Washington. I reserve my time. Gentleman continues to reserve. Gentleman from California. I yield one and a half uh, minutes, Madam Speaker, to my friend and colleague, the Chairman of the Subcommittee on Readiness, the gentleman from Virginia. Mr. Forbes. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized for a minute Thank and a half. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And I rise today in support of the Boehner Resolution, but not because I feel that the President has stated a correct policy for us being in Libya. I think he has, and all that you'll hear on the floor today would lead to a policy that if we adopt it would put us in war with five or six other countries tomorrow. But secondly, I don't support the fact of how he got in there because I think clearly he didn't go through the proper procedures that we need and didn't comply with the uh, War Powers Act. But Madam Speaker, I also realize that regardless of that disagreement, he is the President of the United States. And as such, he has information about our national defense that many members of Congress don't have that we need to have shared with us. 
And second, Madam Speaker, as the President of the United States, when it comes to foreign policy issues of this magnitude, we need to give him some latitude to present that case and make it to this Congress. Madam Speaker, the Boehner Resolution does that in a reasonable way by giving him 14 days to present that information. But I believe, as many people do, at the end of that 14 days, if he hasn't done so, if he hasn't made that case, if he hasn't given us that information, we need to either be prepared to launch the subpoenas to get the information, or we need to be back on this floor taking action to cut off the funding of what's taking place there. And with that, uh, Madam Speaker, I hope we'll support the Boehner Resolution. I think it's a reasonable approach, the correct approach, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. I continue to reserve. The gentleman from Washington continues to reserve his time. The gentleman from California. Madam Speaker, I yield one and a half minutes to my friend and colleague, the Chairman of the Subcommittee on Strategic Forces, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Turner. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized for a minute and a half. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman McKeon. The President has not made the case for our military conflict in Libya. He has told us who we are against, Gaddafi, but he has not told us who we are for. Secretary Gates has told us that we know very little about the opposition. We know very little about the rebels. We do not know their geopolitical view to their neighbors. We do not know their geopolitical view to us. We do not know their commitment to domestic diversity. Are we going to have atrocities? We do not know their ideology. We do not know their preferred form of government. And we also do not know their commitment to nonproliferation of weapons of mass destruction, an issue that's important in Libya. The President has used United Nations approval of civil protection to wage all-out war on Gaddafi without congressional approval or American support. U.S. Admiral Locklear, in charge of the NATO operations against Libya, recently stated that ground troops would be needed to provide stability in Libya once the Gaddafi regime falls. Yesterday, White House Press Secretary Jay Carney said he believes that the President has the support of the majority of the members of Congress. I do not think so. I offered a resolution House Resolution 58 that would voice this body's disapproval of the President's actions in Libya. Seventy-five members have co-sponsored this resolution. I believe it's important for this body's voice to be heard. The, he the President has not provided us any information as to why we are doing this, what a post-Qaddafi regime will look like in Libya, and what will be our involvement. He is committing us to an extended military action, and for Congress to be relevant, our voices need to be heard. I support the Speaker's Gentleman's resolution, and I urge my colleagues to co-sponsor House Concurrent Resolution 58. Gentleman from Washington. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield two minutes to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Moran. Gentleman from Virginia is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise to oppose this motion. <clears throat> the uh, War Crimes Tribunal uh, is about to prosecute prosecute Ratko Mladic about 16 years later. But they've finally gotten him. Why? Because he masterminded the massacre of over 8,000 innocent civilians in Srebrenica. We took the lead in the Balkans. It was a NATO effort. But I think we all know that NATO could not have put an end to those massacres, that genocide, had we not taken the lead. We had to act responsibly, and we had to act in a timely and forceful manner. Now, more recently, there have been any number of times since 2000 when the President has had to use American troops to intervene for humanitarian reasons, against terrorist threats, against whatever was inconsistent fundamentally with our moral values and principles, but also endangered American civilians and troops. To tie the President's hands, whether it be a Republican or Democratic President, is wrong. We should not be doing this. Of course we should be advising the president, working with the president, whoever that president might be. And we have our committee leadership. We have any number of opportunities to do that. But to pass legislation that is designed to tie the president's hands is inconsistent with the legacy of this body, which is to do what is necessary to protect America's interests at home and abroad. May I have one more minute? 
expired. I yield the gentleman an additional minute. Gentleman's right now, with, an additional minute. with regard to Libya, we don't know what the outcome is going to be in Libya. We do know that Muammar Gaddafi is a bad guy. He's not an ally. He's not even reliable in terms of working with in any economic or foreign policy measure. It is an opportunity to establish a government that we can work with. We can't control that government. We're not sure of the outcome, but we know the people putting that government together today want to work with the United States, but they need American support. Obviously, under the umbrella of NATO, that's NATO's purpose. But none of us should be so naive as to think that NATO can operate independent of United States leadership. That's just not the case. We have made the investment in our military capability. We have established ourselves as the world superpower. And with that role comes a concomitant responsibility. You use it appropriately. Let's defeat this amendment. Thank you. Gentleman from California. Madam Speaker, I yield one friend to my uh, one minute to my friend and colleague, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Ridgell. Thank gentleman you. from Virginia is recognized for one minute. I thank uh, Chairman McKeon uh, for yielding, and I rise in strong support of House Resolution 292. I object to the U.S. military intervention in Libya, and my friend uh, and colleague from Virginia actually has far more confidence in the intent and the. Um, the purpose of the, the rebels than, than I do. Uh, I've heard in uh, testimony in Armed Services Committee uh, from multiple top leaders in our country that we simply don't know enough about uh, the rebels. And in my view, not one single provision of the War Powers Resolution has been met that would legitimize the President's intervention in Libya. Uh, since President Obama announced military strikes, Secretary of Defense Gates admitted that Operation Odyssey Dawn was not in the interest, in the vital national interest of the United States. And this legislation, the Boehner Resolution, reflects and meets the deep obligation we have to support our troops and to op uphold the Constitution. Madam Speaker, I ask my colleagues to support this resolution and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Washington. Hey, guy, I reserve, but I wouldn't inquire. I am simply going to uh, give our I'll use up the rest of the time myself. Do you, do you have additional speakers? You know, then I will reserve my time. Thank you. Madam Speaker, I yield one minute to my friend and colleague, the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Palazzo. The gentleman from Mississippi is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The citizens of Mississippi's 4th Congressional District overwhelmingly do not support the President's handling of Libya, and I agree with my constituents. Our country, our military, and their families are fatigued by 10 years of war in Iraq and Afghanistan. The White House has yet to clearly explain to the American people why we should commit more of our precious blood and treasure to a third war. Where is the leadership Americans expect and deserve when it comes to committing our troops to foreign wars? With reservation, I will support House Resolution 292 only because the United States must honor our commitment to our friends and allies engaged in the Libyan conflict. This resolution gives the President 14 days to explain to Congress the scope of our objectives in Libya, and if he fails, we should immediately withdraw our support from the conflict, and as much as we care for our friends and allies, we cannot cast aside the laws of our land. Mr. President, the American people in this Congress have questions and deserve answers. We cannot afford a failure in leadership when American lives are on the line. I yield back. Uh, I would remind members that they should direct their comments to the chair. Gentleman from Washington. I continue to reserve. Gentleman continues to reserve. Gentleman from California. Um, may I inquire as to how much time we have left? The gentleman from California has one minute and the gentleman from Washington has two and a half minutes. And we have the right to close? Then we just have one speaker, so we'll reserve our time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from uh, Washington. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield myself the balance of our time. Gentleman is recognized. The President has said from the outset that our role in this mission will be limited. Limited but critical. Um, we are not committing troops. We are not committing the full uh, force of the U.S. military. But what we are contributing, as Mr. Moran said, is absolutely critical to the success of the mission. We are supporting 
our NATO allies in making sure that this mission is carried out in a very limited and very critical way. And I just want to emphasize again that Muammar Gaddafi is not someone that is in the best national security interests of the United States of America. He has a long, long history of weapons of mass destruction, of supporting terrorist groups, of committing terrorist acts against United States citizens, and of in general being an unstable and destabilizing figure. When the people of Libya decided to rise up to throw him out, it was a very appropriate thing for them to do. Now, we all wish that Mr. Gaddafi would have gone quietly and simply. That certainly would have been the easier way to go, but he didn't. And to protect those people who had legitimate aspirations for a better government, we needed to intervene militarily to assist. Now, I think in this instance, the best thing about this is we were not alone. The Arab League, the United Nations, NATO took the lead. There is a great deal of instability throughout the Middle East, and that is unquestionably in the national security interests of the United States of America to do whatever we can to try and reduce that instability and make sure that we have friends, allies, and also governments that legitimately represent the aspirations of their people. That is one of the greatest problems we've had. We have supported governments in the past in the Middle East who didn't have the support of their people. We need not just the support of governments, we need the support of the people in that region. This is a critical opportunity to gain that support. I believe that's clearly in the national security interest of the American people. So I do not agree with Mr. Banner's resolution in saying that the President has not articulated the case. He has. We in the House should vote whether we approve it or not. But I don't think it is correct to say that the case has not been made. Let's have a vote in this body, as we will on the Kucinich resolution, on whether or not we support what's going on there or not. But we should not simply be asking the President for something he has already provided. And with that, I yield back the balance of my Gentleman time. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Gentleman from California. Uh, Madam Speaker, I yield the remaining balance of our time to my friend and colleague, the gentleman from Indiana, member of the Armed Services Committee, Mr. Young. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized for, I believe, one minute. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise in support, as so many of my colleagues have, of House Resolution 292, because this Congress is a co-equal branch of government, and we must never be a quiet co-equal branch, especially on military matters. When the U.S. sends its sons and daughters in harm's way, it must only be done to protect America's vital national security interests and where there's a clear plan to advance those interests. Now, we know our nation's insolvent with a national debt of over $14 trillion. Our troops are already overextended, we're hearing, in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Meanwhile, the administration's talking about defense spending cuts at the very same time it's piling on this new mission a humanitarian mission, a narrow humanitarian mission, we're told, on top of all our other commitments. Now, what gives? This Congress needs to be heard. Our President has failed to properly define what vital national security interests justify this military intervention, and with this resolution, we give him 14 days to do so. Now, sadly and ironically, by becoming involved in Libya, our NATO alliance, which does remain Fired. a vitally important national uh, security interest, may well have been put at risk. So this Congress will be heard. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. All time for debate has expired. Pursuant to House Resolution, resolution 294, the previous question is ordered on the resolution. The question is on adoption of the resolution. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. Uh, from Madam California. Speaker, I request the yeas and nays. The yeas and nays have been requested. Those favoring a vote by the yeas and nays will rise. A sufficient number having arisen, the yeas and nays are ordered pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20. Further proceedings on this question will be postponed. Maybe. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Florida seek recognition? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Pursuant to House Resolution 294, I call up House Concurrent Resolution 51 and ask for its immediate consideration. The clerk will report the title of the concurrent resolution. House Concurrent Resolution 51.
One, concurrent resolution directing the President, pursuant to to remove the United States Armed Forces from Libya. Pursuant to House Resolution 294, the concurrent resolution is considered read. The concurrent re resolution will be debatable for one hour, with 30 minutes controlled by the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. ross Leighton, and 30 minutes controlled by the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Florida. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I ask unanimous consent that the ranking member of the Committee on Foreign Affairs, my friend Mr. Berman, be allowed to control 15 minutes of my time. Without objection. Thank you. Madam Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. Gentlewoman's recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise in opposition to House Conres 51, directing the President to remove United States Armed Forces from Libya. The President has failed to make the legal and constitutional case that he owes to the Congress and to the American people before committing American forces to a voluntary conflict. But the situation as it stands today is an important, poses an important U.S. national security consideration, and it requires this body to oppose the Kucinich resolution. These are, what are these considerations, Madam Speaker? These are the sudden U.S. withdrawal from Libyan operations proposed by this resolution could do irreparable harm to the NATO alliance and ultimately undermine support for NATO efforts in Afghanistan. Also, the longer Gaddafi is able to cling to power and continue fighting, the more that he will destabilize the larger region. Conflict is already spilling over into neighboring countries, Tunisia, for example, which is undergoing a fragile transition of its own. Also, there are significant proliferation concerns at stake, including the need to secure Libyan chemical munitions and prevent the flow of heavy and light weaponry from leaking across the porous borders of Libya. Also, extremist organizations that pose a credible threat to American interests, inclu including Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb, already are exploiting the opportunity to arm themselves and organize. So while I share the frustration of my colleagues, I am deeply concerned that an abrupt withdrawal of support for the NATO mission would have repercussions that extend far beyond the borders of Libya. Adoption of this resolution would send the signal to Gaddafi that if he can just hang on for just 15 days more, the alliance will crumble and he can reassume, resume his destructive behavior and his destabilizing activities. In Egypt, the stability necessary to prevent extremist elements from seizing control could be compromised if the conflict in Libya remains unresolved. Furthermore, Madam Speaker, providing Gaddafi free reign by forcing the U.S. to rapidly withdraw from the NATO operation would pose an even more virulent threat to such other allies in the region as Israel. An emboldened Gaddafi regime would be in a position to provide both destabilizing types and amounts of con conventional weapons as well as unconventional capabilities through new and existing smuggling routes to violent extremists in Lebanon, the West Bank, and Gaza, extremists who seek the destruction of Israel. A U.S. withdrawal in the manner that is, that is called for in this resolution, in fact mandated in this resolution, could have detrimental consequences for countries such as Jordan and the United Arab Emirates, who provide critical support to the United States and our NATO allies in Afghanistan. And as operations experts from the Department of Defense warned yesterday, an abrupt withdrawal from Libya operations, as this resolution demands, would severely undermine support by our European allies for NATO efforts in Afghanistan. In fact, it would have a detrimental effect on NATO's efforts in Afghanistan, both in terms of weakening our mission partners and emboldening the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and associated elements. It would compromise the safety and security of U.S. forces that at this very moment 
are engaged in a battle against heavily armed enemy forces in Afghanistan. Madam Speaker, as many of my colleagues know, my daughter-in-law, Lindsay, served in Iraq and in Afghanistan. I also have two committee staffers, one in the Army Reserves and one in the Marine Reserves, who recently returned from serving a year each in Afghanistan. They have emphasized that the potential dangers to our troops there of a NATO pullout or a decrease of forces and assets in Afghanistan due to a need to refocus them on ongoing operations in Libya is indeed dangerous for the United States. They have emphasized that operations in Libya do not exist in a vacuum. Recall that the House just this last week adopted an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Bill to prevent U.S. military or private security contractors from establishing or maintaining a ground presence in Libya. Speaker Boehner has offered a resolution that we discussed previously that further underscores that the Congress does not support putting U.S. boots on the ground in Libya. Now, many have argued that Congress needs to strongly exert its prerogatives under war powers. We must do so, Madam Speaker, but do so in a prudent and responsible manner that protects the legitimate national security interests of the United States. This resolution, Madam Speaker, does not do so. So I urge a no vote, and with that, Madam Speaker, I reserve the balance of our time. General Lady reserves the balance.